Welcome to the on-record portion of the Rockridge Report. I'm Kylie Sapp, here with Alexa Clay, co-author of The Misfit Economy. So, you went to Brown, and you went to Oxford, you've co-written a book, and you speak at universities and travel around the world. How did you jump into this so early in your life? <laughs> like, what got you started? Uh, I have no idea. I guess I'm a little bit of a misfit in some ways. Uh, this was definitely not my plan. I had no intention of writing a book about pirates and hackers and gangsters as a child. Um, but both my parents were anthropologists, so I always grew up around kind of eccentric people. Um, my mother studied alien abduction and went around the world talking to people who thought they'd been abducted by aliens. And my dad worked with Amazonian tribes. So for me, it was always, you know, reaching out to people, talking to people who kind of make you uncomfortable or come from very different walks of life was always something that I was interested in. Um, and I had a really great philosophy teacher in high school who really got me thinking more Socratically and existentially about the world and yeah, just equipped me, I think, with a certain set of critical thinking tools that I feel like I've applied to a lot of my work, um, both in terms of writing and then also work um, professionally with social entrepreneurship and social intrapreneurship and things like this. So you founded and co-founded um, several different projects. Can you tell me a little bit about those? Yeah, so the first real project I got into, um, you know, really having grown up in more of an alternative educational system. I went to Quaker school when I was young and then went to an alternative high school that was really self-governing. So I really didn't realize that corporations existed. I didn't know that people were business people when they grew up. So after my master's, I, um, I went and worked within Fortune 500 companies and specifically was doing a lot of consulting work around sustainability strategy. And as a result of that, I tried to bring a kind of anthropological lens to a lot of these different corporate environments. And for me, stumbled upon kind of what I call the lost tribe, you know, this idea of entrepreneurs or people that were acting really as culture hackers within the organization. So started meeting people within huge multinational companies that were trying to build environmental or social ventures within these organizations. We're trying to completely rethink, well, what does a modern energy company look like? How can it be built up around alternatives? Or how do we become part of an urban transport solution, not just manufacturing cars? So one of the first things that I founded was uh, a group called the League of Entrepreneurs, which was really for these culture hackers, these entrepreneurs across huge organizations to come together to find peer support, to feel like, you know, all these insider misfits that were were really um, alienated and so much of their work in the corporate world could find peers and get support in terms of workshopping for their ideas um, and feel like they had a sense of belonging. Um, so I saw that you lived in a windmill in Portugal. Yeah. How did you come about doing that? Can you tell me a little <laughs> bit more about what that was like? Um, I found it on the internet. Uh, yeah, when was that? That was in 2004, I think. Um, so I don't know. I always just loved the whole Don Quixote like myth. And windmills were always beautiful to me. And so, yeah, I rented this windmill. Um, I read a lot of philosophy in the windmill, like I had a whole Hegel phase in the windmill, um, and then would walk around and, yeah, write thoughts, um, and it was beautiful. I think, I think one of the things that I'm a huge advocate for in life is hermit time, which is that really being comfortable with silence, being able to get off the grid, I think actually allows you to really understand who you are as a person and what you value and what you find important. So as much as these experiences might seem like unproductive according to like a CV, for me, you know, taking those detours have always been immensely fulfilling and sort of recharge me and allow me to sort of to, to imagine what I want to do and to stay true to some of the values that I have. Um, so can you tell me a little about the, uh, the Amish futurist, your, yeah. your character? Yeah, do you have an alter ego? I do not. Okay, you should get, everyone should get one. <laughs> Um, the Amish Futurist is an alter ego character that I do. Her name is Rebecca. Um, and so the idea was really that the, you know, I was feeling very critical of the startup scene. Um, the fact that, you know, there were so many technological sort of optimists about that we were using all these digital technologies and they weren't actually making our lives any better. 
you know, they claimed to sort of be social, and yet they were making people feel more cut off, more alienated, uh, less human in so many ways. And so I started dressing up as Rebecca in a bonnet and a prairie dress and wandering around um, to tech conferences, talking to startup founders. And so for me, it was a way of bringing a kind of Socratic questioning of technology startups, but through a very soft voice so I could channel this, this moral conscience um, through this Amish personality and get people to sort of confess, you know, ask them questions about what the bigger impact of what they were trying to do was about. Um. So let's talk about your book a little bit. Why did you, what kind of made you want to write this book? And like, how did you get started with that? It started as a joke, to be honest. It was, um, I was working a lot in the social good space, and so working with entrepreneurs that were trying to change the world. Um, so I worked at Ashoka, I worked with entrepreneurs that were trying to change the world. Um, and then it just became funny to think about vice entrepreneurs, to think about people that um, you know, we don't really read about in business case studies um, who are in the black markets, who are pirates, who are hackers, who are gangsters, who are running drug businesses, and to see, you know, well, well what's out there? Why don't we look at these people in terms of creativity and innovation? Um, and so that's really how it started. And then it became less of a joke once I started interviewing people and getting into some of these stories. Um, and really, yeah, understanding that so many people's lives are in the black market and informal economy. In some countries, it's more than 60 to 70 percent of the economy is informal. So how do we ignore that? You know, how can, how can we actually look at these places as places of creativity? How did you decide which cases to take a deeper look at when you were thinking? Um, about it was about? tough. We started maybe with a list of around 5,000, and so really wanted to keep a broad umbrella from you know people working in slums and waste pickers to sort of hackers on the digital front lines, to Somali pirates. Um, and then also th another sort of protagonist that was very important for us was this insider misfit. So as much as they're sort of people within the underground economies or people in antagonism with the system, what about the, the people that are more camouflaged within systems that are trying to change those systems from within? So started with a huge list and then narrowed it down based on some conversations, based on you know, what stories we thought were the most creative, the most innovative, and also likability. Like everyone in the book was someone that I really believed that their story needed to be amplified in the world. Um, so there were certainly cases where you know, I just felt uh, I didn't want to, you know, Mexican drug cartels or you know, a mafia family in India that I just didn't think had a new story to be told, um, where I didn't think that that misfit was really trying to transform a culture, but they were more conforming to an existing black market system. Which story did you think was the most interesting of all the people that you talked to? Oh, that's hard. Uh, I mean, the earliest conversation I had was the most sort of mind-busting because um, I was interviewing King Tone, the former leader of the Latin Kings, and he said, he pushed back even against my word gang. You know, I was asking him, what was it like to run a gang? And he said, don't call us a gang, call us an organization. Um, and he really got me thinking differently about gang cultures, not within this remit of sort of evil or deviant, but as organizations, as um, places that are stewarding culture. Um, and so he got me to think about them beyond just uh, the instant association of criminality, um, to see a lot of these organizations um, with their human components, too. A lot of your the stories that you tell um, are stories of criminals and stories you know that are illegal. And I mean, you say, several times that you're not condoning any of this, but like, where is the line? Like, did you find a line between like, how do I report this without making it seem like this is something that I'm condoning or doing? Yeah, I think the point of the book was really to, to not just um, glamorize criminality, but to point to people that were actively working to shape cultures. Um, and so, and people that you can empathize with. So I think with King Tone, the reason we chose him was not because he was just a gang leader, but he was a gang leader that was trying to think about how do we outgrow this model of gang? How do we become a social movement? How do we become a civic movement? Um, and so he was trying to pivot that organization, and so that's why his story appealed to me. Um, and it, you know, it was similarly like with the Amish camel milk farmer, someone who 
um, you know, we really don't hear about the sort of informal camel milk trade a lot in the U.S. or even Amish businesses, which you know are an enormously sustainable. Um, many, you know, when the recession happened, were actually able to to really carry on and be thriving because they're built on such. Uh, integrity and, and values and principles. So yeah, the point was really to look at um, stories that built empathy, um, stories that didn't just glamorize criminality, but um, had a creative or innovative component to it. Um, and people that I thought had mixed motivations, where you couldn't just dismiss them as someone that was evil, but you had to see where they were coming from and, and some of the circumstances that they were born in that made them make certain decisions in their life. Well, thank you very much for coming in. Again, this is Alexa Clay, and I'm Kylie Sapp for The Rockbridge Report.